I feel all warm and fuzzy now. Thanks, Remy. Uh, so totally unrelated to anything I'm going to talk to you about today is this. Thank you, yes. So what you're looking at right now is chat.meetspaces, and this is a Mozillian's side project. One of the, I guess one of the co-creators is here today too, Soledad, if you had a chance to talk to her. She's also somebody, she's actually going to be talking about uh, web components and web audio components at Cascadia JS next week, which is going to be pretty cool. But um, I wanted to, to talk about this because I'm kind of obsessed with it right now. So this is using WebRTC, and when people come to this page, they're kind of like, well, well, what is it? And I'm like, exactly, what is it? Uh, imagine that you smash together Vine, like taking a two-second animated movie of someone and turning it into a repeating GIF, combine that with IRC and then the, sort of the uh, transitory nature of Snapchat because we don't store any of these, and you get meet spaces. So I wanted to say hello to everybody here. Here, here we go. Hello from Full Frontal. And so this will now take a two-second GIF of me and uh, pump it out to those people over there, except for I'm tethering, so it goes really, really slow, and that may or may not actually get sent, so it uh, might take a while. Was, did, it, did it just go by? I, I told people that they were going to be on screen at a conference, so it's probably a bit busier than for right now. But um, so, so they're all like, hey, hi. I told them not to do anything that would get me in trouble. <laughs> And I just wanted to highlight this because uh, Mozilla, I mean, this is, this is not an official Mozilla project. It just happens to be built by Mozillians. And I think it's really cool, so I wanted to, to show that off a little bit. So um, anyway, what we are going to talk about today is building mobile web applications with Brick, uh, which is probably going to be a little bit confusing to some of you because on your lanyard it says we're going to build applications with this thing called X tags. And you're like, well, Angelina is going to talk about something to do with web components. What's an X tag? And then, you know, to further confuse you, here I am talking about something called Brick. But I promise you that uh, all of this confusion will be, like the veil will be pulled away and, and all will be revealed. So uh, t the talk's title today is Building Mobile Web Applications with Brick. Um, I have a particularly mobile focus because uh, I, I work on Firefox OS and so I sort of frame everything uh, mobile first a lot of the time. But you can just like pull out the word mobile and just say web applications because I think that anything that you're building these days should probably be mobile first and it's probably going to be a web application. Like the word mobile almost doesn't even need to be there. In, in my opinion, if you're thinking progressively anyway. So uh, I'm Angelina Fabro. Um, I'm obviously not a red panda. I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and uh, that's me on Twitter up there. And uh, you can follow me for things like slides, and uh, my friends were joking since I post a lot about red pandas and pandas that I kind of do and evangelism for, uh, for things. Um, so yeah, I, I work on uh, Firefox OS at Mozilla, and before that I had a primarily mobile focus for about three to five years in, in, um, in dev, and I did uh, you know, native iOS uh, development, I did some Android, I did uh, obviously web stuff. I was at a company called Steam Clock Software, which is a really awesome agency in Vancouver. Um, and so eventually I transitioned to Mozilla. Uh, every, every time a web project came in at Steam Clock, I was the technical lead there and, and the most senior, so I'd just kind of be like, that. That's mine. I want it, and I just take the project. So eventually, it's kind of like, all right, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna move over and do like uh, mobile web stuff full time and, and all that. So that's what I do with Mozilla. Um, so I guess you've, you've kind of heard of us. Um, you know, we make this browser called Firefox. We've launched uh, some some mobile phones recently, which are starting to do quite well, which is pretty awesome. And and that's what I spend a large part of my time on. Um, what's really interesting is I think people misunderstand what like the term evangelist means at Mozilla. I mean, it, it essentially like developer relations. I mean, I do go around and give talks like this, but that's actually about this part of my job. Most of my job is actually figuring out how to make your lives easy as developers. Uh, I'm actually the kind of person that if you're ever making a Firefox OS app and you get stuck, you can email me personally and you're not wasting my time. I will, I will totally help you. And, and same for anything in this presentation. Um, if you have any questions about it or if you watch like another one of my videos on web components and like you just quite don't understand some of that stuff because it's pretty new and some of the, con the concepts are kind of abstract. You can, you can email me and uh, I'm totally down with that. Um, so web components. Web components are the new HTML5, and I know I'm not the first person to have said this. And the reason why I say this is not necessarily because they are the new hotness, and they are, but actually because uh, in our industry we're kind of always having these terminology problems. And the first terminology problem is the web components terminology. So people that are unfamiliar with this topic, uh, how many people here have at least some exposure to web components and like that's not a total buzzword to them? Okay, yeah, but still there's not totally a lot of hands up here. Um, I try and design my presentations just with the assumption that, that most people don't, don't know about that stuff. 
So web components are uh, a conglomerate of technologies that enable the creation of web components. So we all know the term HTML5 um, has come to mean something other than just HTML version 5. In fact, we don't really refer to HTML by version anymore because it's kind of like this living standard that's always growing and changing. Uh, similarly, I mean, we talk about CSS3, but uh, CSS3 doesn't really refer to a version. It refers to, uh, like, CSS modules level three, and CSS4 isn't a version of CSS you know, modules level four and so on. And it gets really confusing if you're somebody that doesn't do standards and for someone to tell you that. Um, so we can probably all agree that HTML5 doesn't mean just HTML5. When people started using the term, actually they meant HTML5, CSS level three modules, and JavaScript, right? Uh, really what this term came to mean is, as HTML5, is that we are building rich, uh, pardon me, rich, featureful web applications in the browser. And so when you tell someone, yeah, I, I build HTML5 apps, that's really what you're saying to them, is I build rich, interactive applications in the browser, and probably JavaScript and, you know, advanced CSS and HTML and these progressive things are a part of that. Similarly, with web components, web components is not just one thing. Web components is sort of a hat term for uh, some browser features that enable the creation of, of web components. Uh, so these technologies are HTML imports, Shadow DOM, HTML templates, and custom elements. There are a few other things that people like to throw under the web components hat, but these are sort of the four key things that enable you to create web components. Um, we're not going to talk about in detail today how all of these things work. If you are interested in, in like, the nuts and bolts of how these things work, um, as Remy said, he saw me give a talk a year ago. It was called Inspector Web and the Mystery of the Shadow DOM. If you do watch that video, uh, it will explain like the underlying concepts of Shadow DOM probably, I, I like to think pretty clearly, Remy seemed to think so. Uh, but one thing about watching that video is like the details are really outdated. So actually a few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, I went to Frontiers and I gave a talk at Frontiers called The Return of Inspector Web, and I don't know if that video is out yet, but I would recommend that one because it actually talks about, oh, pardon me? Oh, okay, cool, all right, it's gonna be online this weekend. I was not expecting that. Um, but uh, th that one is worth watching because uh, what I tried to do in that one is, is actually said like, okay, here's these technologies again. How far have we come in a year? And I talk about things like Brick, which I'm talking about today, the Polymer project and all that sort of stuff. And of course I talk about like, you know, this current state of implementation in browsers, which is actually what you people care about. Um, so HTML imports is pretty simple. Uh, loosely explained, it is the ability to use like a link tag and import an HTML document, much like you would import CSS, which allows you to import, uh, you know, templates and stuff like that. Shadow DOM, uh, which I'll talk about again in a second, is sort of like the glue. It gives us the opportunity for encapsulation. Uh, and then HTML templates is, uh, you know, that, that script tag thing we were talking about earlier, and you can put, like, type whatever and sort of use those script tags as templating. Well, now we're going to have templating built right into the browser. So client-side templating moves into the browser, which I think is really cool. And the thing that we're really going to focus on today is the creation of custom elements, which is effectively what Xtag and Brick allow you to do. Uh, the concept of Shadow DOM, actually, is basically that you have a tiny document, in this case a document fragment, although it may change to be a full-fledged document because the spec is changing, uh, document essentially hidden in an element. So if I have a page that has five div elements in it, right, just a simple page inside the body, there's some div elements, it doesn't even matter what the children are of those div elements, and then I create a Shadow DOM and put it inside of one of those elements and give that Shadow DOM its own content, what will happen is the rendering of the Shadow DOM will replace the rendering of its parent element. But if you were to iterate over the, the parent document, which has your five divs in it, and you were to encounter one that had a shadow DOM, and let's say that shadow DOM has, I don't know, five divs in it, it would be invisible to the parent page. The page does not know that that shadow DOM is there. In fact, that div does not know that it's a shadow DOM. And so I really like this image here, which I, I used at um, Frontiers, and it's because this, ca you know, like, sir, do you know that you're a cat? And the cat's just like, <gasps> <laughs> like, if you were to tell that element, did you know that you have a shadow DOM, it'd be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So that's, that's a, an important concept that I think that, um, even though I went over it really quickly, is, is important to, to note. So, I mean, all these technologies enable these things called web components, and uh, what is a component? Well, a component, loosely defined, is a constituent part of something. So for, you know, for trying to create a web application, uh, a component is one piece of that. And I would argue that a component, for uh, all intents and purposes, is, is one discrete uh, widget that does some, one, really good, one thing really well. 
and uh, they're essentially black boxes, which is where this encapsulation idea comes in. So uh, we can use resistors without necessarily having to understand how they work. I mean, resistors are not terribly complicated, but you don't necessarily have to know how they work in order to use them. Similarly, a doorbell. Like, the inner workings of that doorbell there are obfuscated away from us. We know how to operate the doorbell, at least I hope we do, um, and we don't necessarily have to know its inner workings. Now, if we wanted to, we could dissect the doorbell and figure out how it works. If you're someone like me, you might take apart that stuff and just be like, what's in there? And the same is true for web components as well. It's not as though, like, if somebody hands you a web component widget, like for a calendar or for uh, some, you know, login widget or something like that, that you can't necessarily go and find out how it works, but the idea is that it is abstracted, it is abstracted away, and then when you have that encapsulation, you um, don't clobber other variables in your page, you don't clobber other widgets in your page, it creates like a nice tight bundle of all the functionality and uh, styles that you need to do one thing really, really well. Uh, and so, you know, why build custom elements? Well, the benefits are encapsulation. You know, as this web components technology progresses, the encapsulation is, is nice. Uh, reusability is another thing, is that when you sort of prototype out one of these widgets using, using uh, X tags or brick, as I'm going to describe, it allows you to then declaratively reuse that element over and over again. And as we know, reuse is awesome. Uh, it's, it's fairly robust and also very, very expressive. One of the things that I really like about creating these custom elements is that I can then hand off the custom elements to someone who is a designer that may not be as confident with JavaScript, and I can tell them, here's how this component behaves. You can throw this custom tag in the page to get the component, and here's the ways that you style it, and then that designer can confidently like throw those tags in there declaratively and be using them, and if they have you know, behavior issues, maybe they can tweak the JavaScript or they come back to me and, and we work together in that sort of arrangement, but I do think that, that creating these custom elements is a huge opportunity for the expressiveness of web development and also for rapid prototyping. Imagine you have a set of a bunch of widgets that are like, you know, you've got like calendar, maybe, maybe you've got the set of brick widgets, uh, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and you've got a bunch of mobile app kind of widgets. You can hand those off to a developer who doesn't necessarily need to know how they work and they can rapidly prototype an application for you. So what's brick? Brick are custom elements built using X tags. Okay, so what's X tag? Um, and these are, these are mobile application elements that have like a mobile, mobile app focus. Um, and so Xtags is a library that takes advantage of, uh, sorry, Xtags is a library that takes advantage of uh, sort of the features of web components that are coming in, in evergreen browsers and allows the creation of custom elements. And it does so in a way that is very similar to how the W3C spec says that we should allow custom elements. So how is Brick different from other web components frameworks, right? So uh, Xtag is the enabling technology that allows us to create these custom elements. And Brick is a name that's sort of going to take over Xtags, it seems like, because people are sort of using them interchangeably. Xtags enables the creation of Bricks, and Bricks is sort of like our little library of widgets that we've created that are easy, easy to reuse. But uh, they're quickly becoming interchangeable, and actually I was just talking with, with Soledad, who, who works on uh, Brick components, and she was telling me, she's like, we should probably just tell people it's Brick from now on. So for all intents and purposes, it's Brick. Um, and people ask, you know, well, how is Brick different from other web components frameworks? Um, well, first thing is that Brick is not a, 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 it's not a framework. Um, it's, a select, it's, it's an opportunity for you to be able to create custom elements yourself. And uh, if, you, if you just use Xtags as a library, like you're given no custom components if you don't want them. You can create only your own custom stuff. And uh, who's talking to me on IRC? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Someone in DevTools, actually. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. I thought that might actually be relevant to this because I was talking to people about it, but let's, let's turn off RC. There we go. But uh, <laughs> only slightly embarrassing. Um, so Brick, yeah, so Brick, and so Brick is actually a small library that enables the creation of DOM elements in the way that, that Xtags does. They're essentially interchangeable. Um, how Brick is different from other web components sort of frameworks is that it's not a framework. So if you compare it to something like Polymer, which is a really fantastic framework that's using uh, web components principles and sort of pushing forward in, in that area, uh, we don't have anything with Brick like uh, dirty checking and two-way binding. That's left up to you. We're s essentially giving you either the bare bones with like the core of Xtag or Brick to create your own elements, or we're giving you very minimal components with uh, a little bit of behavior and a little bit of styling for you to do what you want with them. The idea is that we actually didn't really want to write a framework because what happens is with Firefox OS, we get a lot of uh, developers that come to us and say, how do we build Firefox OS apps? And I'm like, it's just web development. Use whatever you want. And they're like, okay, 
And they come back like a few days later and they're like, well, how do we build Firefox OS apps? And I'm like, well, you can use anything you want. And it, it's like a little bit of, um, if they haven't done mobile development before and they haven't used HTML5 for mobile development, it's sometimes it's a little difficult, I think, for people to wrap their head around. So at Mozilla, we were like, well, let's provide people with some basic widgets, at least for prototyping. And then that can at least help them get over, get over that little uh, sort of a conceptual hurdle because a lot of the times I go through like the hello world with people in the Firefox West simulator and then they're like, oh, it is just web development. Um, so Brick is sort of like a tool to kind of give people that little aha moment as well. Um, so yeah, and, and the thing is with Brick, if you really wanted to, you could actually use it in conjunction with the framework. Uh, that is an opportunity as well, but you don't necessarily have to. So a uh, small application using Brick, that's actually what we're gonna build today, and I'm gonna show you step-by-step step how you can use Xtag and, and Brick uh, summarily to create a very, very, very small, um, unglamorous application. So the code for all this is actually up here, simple Brick demo, probably not a lot of you have internet, but there it is anyway. Um, and actually, I've put these extra slides in here because I do recognize that some people will be watching this talk at home later. If you go into this repo, there's actually a folder called demo, and it will have all of the demo broken into the three steps that I'm going to go to, so you know, anybody following along should be able to, to see it in action. So step one is actually to, to add some bricks. So this little snippet right here is just a standard like husk of uh, HTML5 uh, document. And uh, I've got like a title, I've got some CSS included there. You can see that I have uh, the brick CSS included. Do I, have a, do I have a green thing here? Yeah, I do. You can see that I've included um, brick at the top there. I've included my own CSS. At the bottom, I've included brick, and I've included my, my own JavaScript for custom stuff. And I've just got a comment saying that some brick widgets will go here. And this is not terribly exciting, nor should it be to anybody in the audience, because this is just standard <coughs> web development, and it, there's nothing really spectacularly different about it. And so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a component called X, Xdeck. And uh, Xdeck is a, you can kind of think of it as like a deck of cards. And in fact, that's the best analogy because you actually use a deck and cards to construct it. What it is, is it's a series of uh, views, essentially X cards that you can transition between. And essentially you get a kind of view management for your mobile application. Now let's actually go take a look at um, Mozilla Brick. I wanna actually show you the Brick website for a second here, which is right there. And I wanna take a look at this because they've got some pretty fantastic stuff uh, up at the website here. Uh, in particular, uh, one thing I think that uh, the people working on this at Mozilla did really well is that they happen to have a lot of fantastic documentation for every single component that, uh, that they talk about. Oh, that's sad. That actually could be something to do with my connection because I'm tethering right now. But um, uh, the website for Brick is mozilla.github.io uh, slash brick. And actually, let's see the toggle flip seat in action. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, so just so you're wondering, like, where I got these things from, um, if I actually, let's try documentation and demos again. Here we go. If we go to xdeck, all of the documentation for this component that I'm using here is all under Xdeck on the website there, and it will explain it for you if I don't do a good enough job. So uh, what we do is we pop in these HTML tags here for Xdeck, and as children of the Xdeck, we have X cards, and inside those X cards, I can have any kind of arbitrary content that I want. For example, uh, here I've put that this is view one, and this is view two, and that's actually really, really simple. If we pop over to my first demo here, you can see, and uh, if this view looks a little bit foreign to you, I'm using the responsive design view in the Firefox dev tools, which is, which is kind of nice because it allows me to sort of like, I think it should allow me to switch between, yeah, there we go, I can do port, landscape mode, portrait mode. But this is actually a really great tool when you're doing mobile application development in any case. So what I've got here is um, I have uh, my, my view one, um, and uh, that's my first X card. If I pop over to this next slide, uh, I'm gonna add something else that's, that's kind of special, and it's an app bar element. Uh, as children to the app bar element, I have a header and I have some buttons, and what this widget effectively gives you is, well, an app bar. It gives you that sort of standard top bar element that you see as a common uh, design pattern for mobile applications. So popping back over to my, to my first part of my demo here, you can see that I've got like this really simple thing, it's just a simple brick app, and I've got some, some buttons, and if I click those buttons, I can actually cycle through the views. I can go forward and back. Popping over to Sublime Text and looking in the JavaScript, uh, at the very top here, this is some, this is some quick and dirty code to, to just show you um, that I've selected the deck element, I've selected those buttons, the next button and previous button, and then I've just added a lister so that when those buttons are pressed, it actually uh, operates on the deck and shuffles forward and back as you would expect. So, 
with just a little bit of code, just with uh, the X app bar and uh, the X deck, we've already got like most of the framework of being able to transition between views for a mobile application, which is pretty cool. And uh, I popped over there and totally forgot that I had this slide, which is exactly the same code. So there you have it again, ladies and gentlemen. There is uh, me selecting the deck and the buttons and at attaching those listeners for you. And we do have this document add event listener, which is very similar to jQuery's document ready. Uh, the reason for this is that we just need to make sure that all of the DOM components have loaded properly so that uh, once everything is loaded, uh, X tag can do its magic and figure out like where the custom elements are, register them with the browser. Because uh, without the magic of the X tag library, and if you're in a browser that doesn't have document register, which makes this thing possible, the browser will encounter the elements and be like, well, what's this? What do I do with it? It's nothing. It will throw it away. So you've actually got to you've got to have that in there so that um, any code that relies on brick being loaded and relies on your components being loaded is executed um, appropriately. So uh, this is just a little bit of CSS I added. I added a little bit of padding to my app bar and uh, I gave it a minimum height and I made the, the background of the cards have a gray background, which I think is probably impossible for you to see because projector contrast is never very good. And a little bit of padding. And I've already referred to demo one, so we'll keep going. So now step two, let's add in some more interesting content and let's do that using some bricks. So the next thing we're gonna add is in one of our cards, we're going to add an X date picker. Now this here is actually a polyfill for input type date. Uh, and what will happen is if it detects that you actually have uh, input type date supported, it will use that in the browser. If it doesn't, then it will give you a nice sort of like popover kind of widget. And I decided that I would include a random cat because why not? And so one of the cards will now have a random cat. And uh, let's go take a look at demo number two. And there we go. All right, so we're in view one, still just a vanilla view. I didn't decide not to do anything special to that one. Uh, and here's our date picker. Okay, so I can click there. We get a nice date picker. That's pretty awesome. Uh, if I don't select a date, it gets angry at me. Seems like reasonable behavior. And the very last slide, holy cow, there's a cat. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't look very happy, does he? It's, it's a random cat. Actually, um, the code that I'm using for this, this random cat is uh, from, uh, what's it, a website called, um, I'm in the first demo. It's from a website called like Lorem Pixel. It's sort of like Lorem Ipsum, but for, but for images. And so if I just give it uh, this URL here, it'll just give me a random cat. So that's pretty awesome. If you ever need random cats, that's where you find them on the internet. And, uh, <laughs> But you know, I mean, this is still not, not terribly ex exciting yet because we just have this uh, simple app bar and uh, the X deck going on here. So what if we turn our random cat into a brick? Like let's make it so that when we click on the cat, we get another random cat. Huh, huh, yeah, okay. So the first thing we need to do is register our custom element with some JavaScript. And this is of course, as I mentioned, is so that the DOM and our, and our own custom JS knows what to do with the custom tag. And we do this with xtag.register. Now, it's worth noting that we're calling xtag.register because we're using this uh, sort of you know, polyfill library that gives us a web component-like behavior in our browser. Uh, in the future, this xtag.register will hopefully be replaced with document.register, and this will be built into the browser. And this is just an example here showing that uh, in a minimal example, we want to name our, our component. Now, the W3C specification for custom elements indicates that all custom element names must contain a hyphen. So this one, as an example, just says your dash brick. And uh, then we also say that we also tell it for a lifecycle callback that when it's created, uh, set the inner HTML to be I am a brick. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, people often ask, well, why was this library originally called xtag? And that is sort of a throwback to uh, an earlier time in the specification development where uh, it was posited that all of these custom tags should always have an x dash prefix. And there was like a kind of an outcry about that. We're like, no, well, that's going to be really limiting. Well, well, what happens if, you know, the, the idea here is we want to avoid like namespace collisions or name collisions. Uh, you know, well, what happens if, you know, three different libraries I want to use implement an x date picker, but I only want to use one of them, but I've included all three. And I'm like, well, you should probably not include all three, but let's say you do. <laughs> um, I mean, giving people more opportunity for being creative with naming, I think probably implies that you would have less of those collisions, so they, they removed that restriction. But xtag was originally called xtag because we thought that things were gonna have that x prefix, and so it's kind of stuck around. Uh, and so for our purposes here, we're gonna do xtag.register, and our, our tag name is gonna be random-cat, because that is a hyphen in it. Hyphen in it. And uh, when it's created, uh, we're gonna have this created callback that uh, sets the inner HTML to be this URL, uh, or pardon me, this image tag with um, HTTP, lorem pixel, 300, 300 cats, this URL. And then uh, I'm also going to set up a click event so that when the random cat tag is clicked on, 
then it will load up another random cat. Now, if you're wondering what I'm doing here is, uh, I'm actually, this, this line here is probably actually irrelevant, but this line here, um, I'm adding a new date and getting the time, and adding a new date time on the end of it so that that invalidates the cache. This is just a hack here, and I don't think this should ever be in your production code, but this is a demo, so it's there. Um, so that's just so that when I set uh, the image source that the browser doesn't go, hey, this URL is the same thing. I don't need to go fetch again. This is, this is so that it invalidates that, and it goes fetching um, another cat, as we would expect. And so inside of the X card, I'm gonna put um, a random cat, and that's it. So there's, there's no longer an image tag there. There's just a, a random cat tag. So if we go over to demo number three, and okay, I've actually got the tools open here so you can see when there is a request, but, so we've got view number one, we've got our date picker again, which, you know, it's pretty cool. And then we get to the last one, and there's a random cat, hello there. And if we click on the cat, oh, my internet's so slow, cat request, come on, yeah, there we go, a random cat, because why not? Well, thank you, thank you. And if we click on it again, uh, uh, wait for it. Uh, it's gonna be slow. Yeah, so my internet's really slow. But you did see at least one random cat, therefore you know that it works. Um, theoretically, you would click on it and each time it would invalidate the cache and then it would cause another request and you would uh, have another, another random cat image there. So, so that's that. that. That was the quick and dirty way of creating an <coughs> element, uh, solving the most practical problem that web developers face and that's injecting random cats into your document. So <laughs> you can clearly see uh, how important this is. But uh, so you saw that I was, uh, I was paying attention to something that was this lifecycle callback. So beyond just the lifecycle, each, each custom element has its own lifecycle actually. Uh, you can have a Events, or events that fire uh, are when it's created, when it's inserted into the DOM, when it's removed, and when particular attributes are changed. And so you can take advantage of these, these particular, uh, these callbacks and when these fire um, so that you can do various things throughout the life cycle of your element as needed. And I find that actually particularly, particularly helpful. The other thing I wanna note is that um, the, up here it says extends, it's, it's extending div. Uh, by default, if you don't put anything in this here, you will be extending a div element, but if you do want to extend uh, an or create a custom element with a prototype that's not necessarily just like a you know, div element or HTML element, you can uh, extend other things like an unordered list, you could extend a button element to create like a super button element, so that gives you the opportunity to take, the, take advantage of some, some prototypal inheritance there. Um, but you can actually do some more stuff, like you can actually have cu custom getters and setters. Uh, you can also sort of tack on your own custom methods. Um, for people who are familiar with like sort of the ang Angular directives in a sense, like there's a lot of configuration options here that are not the same as Angular, but uh, you can sort of define, they're sort of defined up front in, in a very similar fashion. Um, and so uh, there's these custom accessors and, and methods and you can tag on a lot of extra stuff here. Um, I'm going through this really fast, but before I go, I want to demo something that I think is particularly awesome, and it was made with brick. So what we're looking at here is this thing called AppMaker, and this just started as sort of a side project, again, by someone who's a Mozillian, because that's just how these things go, and they thought that, um, you know, brick components were pretty, pretty cool. And what they decided to create is like, well, wouldn't it be cool if I created like a WYSIWYG editor, right? Uh, just as a demo, because as all of us know, the code that's generated from WYSIWYG editors is really not that great most of the time, and uh, also you can't always necessarily have the same control that you want uh, developing your application with just a simple drag and drop thing. Who here made uh, uh, web applications in the days of like Angel Fire and GeoCities? Yeah, me too, right? Do you guys, like, I remember coding HTML and then, like, and then, and then, and then GeoCities, I think it was, did this thing where they're like, we have a drag and drop editor, or like, we have a WYSIWYG editor, and I was like, wow, that's gonna make me develop things so much faster. No, no, it did not. It just made me sad. Um, but the cool thing about this is, every time I look at it, there's more stuff here, so hold on a sec here, let me drag, let me, fireworks, let's drag that in there. I'm worried this one will be a bit laggy too, just because, um, just because I'm actually uh, on on the, the tethering here on my phone, and so it's not that, not that fantastic. But the cool thing about this is that everything that you see, if I inspect it. Um, actually, it's, it's really hard for you to see up here, but actually uh, inspecting these, these are all X tag, com or all X tag components, or all brick components. This person has actually created all of these uh, using these, this custom element method. So that's actually pretty, pretty interesting. And this allows you to actually drag and drop and create and prototype a mobile application. You can add extra pages, which are essentially like, you know, cards in a deck kind of thing. Click me. 
Oh, that didn't do anything. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other really cool thing about this is if I hit the publish button, what it will do is it will give me a URL with an install button. And if you browse to that URL on a Firefox OS phone and hit install, you can then play with your prototyped app immediately on the phone. It will install it for you. So for somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience developing or someone who's a designer and wants to rapidly prototype an idea, you can use something like, like this, using these custom tags, using a WYSIWYG editor, drag and drop and push it right to the phone and say like, hey, here's a thing with, you know, here, here's four different pages in four different views and uh, apparently a fireworks component and uh, install it on your phone and see it and then, you know, show it off to someone who's a developer and say, okay, what are the next steps that we do to turn this into a, a fully fledged application? So this is, uh, it's, I think it's, it was originally called Flathead, but we've called it AppMaker now, but it's flathead.herokuapp.com and when you're, when you're back on an on a actual laptop with an internet connection, I recommend playing with it because it's actually pretty cool. So that is AppMaker. Um, and that is a really quick introduction to Brick and uh, Xtags, which are essentially the same thing. Uh, the, the important thing to remember is that Brick is just a set of um, mobile application widgets that uh, are made using, using Xtag. And uh, I've already closed the, the Brick webpage, but if you go to mozilla.github.io slash Brick, you will have a pretty fantastic list of widgets that are available for you to use that are designed around mobile application patterns, but that you could use in pretty much every uh, application that you make. Um, people usually ask the question, and I'll just say it now, like, well, what is the browser support like? And it is cross-browser. Uh, I believe uh, we go back to IE9, I think. Uh, so if you wanted to use this in an application today, it is supported, and we definitely care about you being able to use it cross-browser. Another question is, you know, well, uh, if I use the, you know, Mozilla Brick library, but I want to transition to something else later, you know, how, how similar are your, are the implementations of web components between, say, Brick and something like the Polymer project? And the answer is actually that they're sharing code. So if you go and look in Xtag and you go and look in the Polymer project, you'll actually find that, that we're actually sharing code with the Polymer project because they've done a lot of excellent work there. And uh, we're going to keep collaborating so that you as web developers aren't using you know, multiple libraries uh, where these things like you know, aren't consistent. At, at least this way, while the spec is developing, if it's, if it's wrong, it's consistently wrong in one way, is sort of my attitude towards things, uh, which I think is actually, actually kind of important because uh, the, the specification for things like Shadow DOM is actually in really big flux right now. Uh, for other things like HTML imports, a little bit less so, but that's, I think that's really important so that we're not duplicating effort and we're sharing in the true sort of open, open source sense of the word. So some choice resources that I have in here for you um, is the Web Components Explainer, which uh, is worth reading if you want to understand more about how things like HTML imports, custom elements, and all that are being implemented in the browser. This is a lot more digestible than reading the W3C spec because you need to keep in mind that the W3C spec is not written for you. It's not a user manual. It's a guide for implementers so that implementers, uh, people actually like, you know, writing your browser for you, know how to implement these things so that they are interoperable, so that they are cross-platform compatible so that we ideally minimize the number of, of cross-platform bugs that you have to then you know, deal with as developers out there. So reading the explainer is, is probably really the way that you want to go. If you do want to get in the nitty-gritty of the W3C spec, and I encourage you to like I did, then, then do it, but that's a good starting point if you're fairly new. Um, there's a link there from Mozilla App Maker. There's a link to Xtags obviously a link to Brick, but also uh, the HTML5 Rocks article on custom elements that Eric Bielman wrote is really fantastic and worth reading as well. He's done an excellent job going over the topic there as well. And so that's it. <laughs> cool, thank you.